Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about digital media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about what we're going to spend a little more time on. So it's the, uh, it's the, the fifth of our six episodes where we just look at what we're going to do over the next three to four months. So if you've got suggestions, Friday is typically an infrastructure day. So uh, logistics and tech and networking and all the things that it takes to the kind of the underlying things that it takes um, to get everything done is usually our Friday. So if you've got ideas around what we should be covering on Friday, um, then uh, then go ahead and throw those into Makana. You can also, of course, ask more general questions for the first hour. And tomorrow we'll be doing the same thing with education. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. He says, with the news of Nikon slash Red's case being dismissed, will we soon see more cameras with internal raw recording capabilities? So to be clear, that you, you can actually record internally raw. You just can't compress it. That's the problem right now. Uh, Blackmagic gets around this by partially debearing. So basically, there's a raw means I'm just going to grab the, the data off of the chips um, and I'm going to save it. Uh, and I'm not going to try to debear it. De the debearing process is what has happens with the chips, the, with the CMOS chips to get that data back out. Um, we're not going to do that. We're just going to grab onto it and save it. And that's a raw format. Uh, what Red figured out how to do in the early days was to take that and compress the raw data. So with, before they debear it, they compress it down and they, they got something that visually looks good, um, but it is but it is compressed, and that's what they patented uh, is that process. And then um, what Black Magic did, you're probably like going, well, what 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 does Black Magic do that makes that work? Black Magic partially debears that chip, <laughs> so they take it, they partially do a debearing process, um, which gets them around the patent specifically. I mean, I think that's the only reason they do it that way, and then they save it out, and so it gives you most of the benefits of debearing um, without having to go pay uh, red uh, licensing fees. Uh, Red has been fairly successful at um, managing these things. It's one of their few advantages uh, to other cameras. I mean, Red, I think, you know, definitely pushed the outer envelope when they arrived, um, but we don't see Red in the wild very often anymore. <laughs> so, so I, you know, it was it was a big it was a big rage for quite some time. And and basically, what happened in a lot of ways was that uh, that. Uh, Black Magic came up from from one side and provided a lot of really high end cameras at a very low price, and at the same time, um, Sony, Canon, but primarily Sony, Sony, Canon, Panasonic all responded to Red um, and per started producing cameras that were very cost effective. Um, Sony probably being the the most effective at that, um, uh, you know, up until now. So between those, that that kind of that pincer movement <laughs> where they got squat, they got kind of squashed. We don't really see again. Most of us don't see red in production almost ever, you know. And then and then of course, Airy continued to manage the kind of the upper end of it. And so uh, so uh, you know, there are a handful of folks that use it. There's some global shutter options from Red that make it useful for LED walls and and a lot of other things like that. Um, but they're not, they're not as, so I think that the, the patent has been something that they've been trying to hang on to. Um, and so Nikon making this deal, they didn't win. Nikon didn't win. They dismissed it. I think it was like a, whatever they call it, a something 41, case 41 or process 41, um, which means that they could still bring it back. Um, it sounds like Nikon might have quietly maybe settled with red. <laughs> it's like, or red decided it wanted to settle like um, Nikon, Nikon basically said, we want to invalidate all the patents. Like that's what, that's what they were after. They're not after trying to say we should be able to use it or anything else. They wanted to eval invalidate. So the risk for Nikon was losing and having these cameras and having to pay a lot of uh, damages. The risk for Red was they may actually uh, lose their patents, which would be a big problem for them. So I think both of them decided that pro my guess is, is that Nikon probably threw some money at, at Red, and but not as much as they would have. And uh, they quietly walked away. Um, so I think that that's what appears to have happened. But we, we no one knows, because, and no one will probably ever know except for the companies <laughs> about what, what actually happened. But it wasn't a win. It was just a detente. Uh, next question. Craig Kadoki is up next, and he's in Toronto and says, Today is the day of awareness and to remember people who have been injured or killed in the workplace. An appropriate time to discuss how we work, the shortcuts we shouldn't take, and maybe talk about the mental health aspects as well. Go, Bill. 
Yeah, all of these things are incredibly important. I know that since we're in the production arts, um, one of the most uh, enhancing moments in my life to a thing that I already understood from my early days on sets, set safety is really easy to forget about or neglect or not give the emphasis it is worth a, particularly when you're starting out and you're working on small crews and you're thinking, oh, I don't have time to tape down the ca cable, so I'll just leave them open, even though I'm in a public place or something like that. You, you learn the first time you get snapped how important it is. And it escalates up to the point where the tragic thing happened. There was a film crew on a railroad crossing and the director keeps saying, go farther, farther back to a young woman who was working on the crew. And sure enough, a train showed up and she was killed in the instance and everybody just went yeah it's never worth that so even if you're running a small resume film or something like that if you are not if you as a director or producer or somebody who has authority on set over a crew doesn't have a little piece of your mind going is this safe my feeling is that you're not doing your job right we've got to think of this all the time because it's just too important and people lose their lives and get massively hurt by not paying attention to this. Next question. Uh, next question, Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Asus is about to release four AMD powered Stream Deck rivals, but they will have the software, well, but will they have the software support and infrastructure to overcome Stream Deck? All right, go ahead, Jonas. I doubt it. Um, the Stream Deck SDK is one of the best SDKs for independent developers to work with. Um, they have this beautiful architecture where any and it's really any, like any software that can compile down to an executable can work with it. They use uh, a clever way of using local uh, web sockets in the local uh, server to communicate. And everything is web socket based. So it's just really nice architecture where you don't really need to use a specific language, a specific framework. You can do whatever you want. You can literally build it from Rust to native C to JavaScript. You can build it wherever you want, whatever you want, and that is really cool. Um, most companies, politics, are, don't allow them to do it this good. Like, I've, it's the best SDK I've seen from a developer perspective, just with the openness of like, hey, here's everything that you need to do, do it. And um, we're talking, I, about, and you're talking yeah. about the Stream Deck, right? The Stream Deck. Yeah, I'm in... talking about the, about the Stream Deck, and then even if you have. Um, yeah third party support like companion then it gets even wider but like even just the native stream deck apps are really great yeah and and i think that what asus is right um, is actually releasing is a competitor to the steam deck which is more like a game boy um and so um so the stream deck is is there's a reason why it's doing so well and Jonas very uh <laughs> answered the right answered a question that was probably more apt to us <laughs> you know which is that why is the stream deck not uh uh, is, is hard to hard to uh, compete with, and so uh, the Steam Deck itself and Asus's releases uh, are probably um, you know I, who knows, um, but uh, but I, I don't know of any I don't know of uh, of Asus um, releasing anything that looked is like the what the Stream Deck that we're talking about. They're, they are releasing some competitors to the Steam Deck, uh, which is kind of a Game Boy um, thing there. So yeah, but uh, but to Jonas's point, um, I think that. Uh, the Stream Deck has really well placed itself really well, and it's why so many, you see it everywhere. I've got a couple of them on my desk. Uh, I think a lot of us have a couple of them on our desk, and it's because of the the underlying architecture that Jonas um, outlined. So it's, it's, it's very competitive, and I don't know if it'll have a lot of competition anytime soon. Uh, next question. David Brady in New York, New York says, looking for a budget-friendly alternative to my trusty AKG 451. Executives with discerning ears like the quality, but the price is a bit much for a fly kit. Any good options? Go ahead, Alexander. You know, thankfully these days, there's no shortage of options available. And there's actually quite a few good ones for under $1,000. There's three microphone stereo pairs I would suggest looking at, and I'll post links here. One is the uh, the Rode NT5s, which are very affordable, and also the the new Universal Audio Pencil Condensers. Those are the um, uh, the SP ones. Uh, they do not have any pads or any kind of switches on there. The third option, which is actually rather unique, is the Lewitt LCT140 Airs which are kind of cool because they give you the pad, they give you the low cut filter, and they have one switch to change the tonal characteristic 
of those microphones. They've got a air switch, which uh, gives a high frequency boost. And then in the flat position, it's a more linear uh, frequency response. Um, so you should be able to do some interesting things with those. And uh, I think they're well under $500 US here. Next question. Next question comes to us from Tim Mann in Melbourne, Australia. And Tim asks, in DaVinci Resolve, is there a way to, of saving and then recalling the audio inputs specifically for recording? You know, I don't know if there are. The way I kind of, I, when I'm having complex audio setups, I tend to, re, I tend to save out projects that I'm going to reopen and then use for that, that specific thing. So rather than trying to save out a, a specific audio um, alignment, inside of Resolve, what I do is I save the project. I get it all set up exactly the way I want it, leaving it that way. Or even if I had a bunch of tracks in there that I that I set up, I will delete them all and save that file as basically a template. I don't save it as a template, but I save it out that I'm gonna use that as I bring it back in. And so that's the way I manage that process. I'm not sure if it's the best way, but that's the way I've done it in the past when I have complex systems that are Oftentimes with surround, you end up with a very complex set of channel operations. And I found that it was easier to just open another, open an older project that I've taken everything out of that, that is the, in the formats, both visual and, and audio that I need. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Guy Cochran in Seattle. And Guy says, what is the coupon code to get the $150 light version of Universe software for free? And he notes, hint. In the Discord, hat tip to Andy Carluccio. I don't even know what that is now because it's it's a it was he a guy threw a Cochrane, but he wasn't here. Like it's, it's like right. he, he just threw a random Cochrane. A remote no, Cochrane. No, yeah, a remote Cochrane. That's a remote Cochrane. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Bill. Uh, this is very cool. You know, we keep saying we're an expensive group of friends to have here on the show, but in this case, we're a money saving group of friends to have. Everybody's uh, been talking about Universe for a long time. Very powerful thing, and this will help you get into it for free. Uh, and it's also a good reason why, if you haven't joined the Office Hours Discord yet, this would be a good day to be there. Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely take advantage of this and and uh, download the free version. It, it makes it a lot easier for us to also do labs and training and so on and so forth when there's a version that everyone can get a hold of. So, um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, next question. Craig Kadoki, Toronto, Canada, back in with what, uh, without getting into politics, one of the issues public service workers in Canada are striking over is to have remote working language added to the CBA. How might this impact other sectors? And are you surprised that it's coming from this sector? You, you know, it's, what's interesting is, is that a, everyone, a lot of people are trying to pull employees back to the workplace. Um, and the employees are not not that interested in doing that, or a large segment of them aren't. Um, and so, uh, it's it's going to be really interesting to watch this push and pull. There's kind of it felt like we went really far forward, and then we tried to pull back. But the problem is, there's just too much. There's a lot of resistance um, to that. There's a lot of people that are forcing some employees to do it, but the talking to employees that are getting pulled back, what they're doing is they're a lot of them are going back to work. You know, if they, if they don't want to come back. They come back to work as asked, and so everyone thinks that, that it's working well, but all of them are working on their LinkedIn profiles, <laughs> like, like like everybody. And so it creates, the, the problem with that is that for all organizations is that when people are trying to figure out how to leave, they work differently. It's not just that they they eventually are going to leave you. Um, they are not engaged in, in their job the same way anymore. Um, when you kind of push them up against something that they absolutely don't want to do, uh, it, you know, they're less effective, they're less efficient, you know, all of those things. And so a lot of companies who have, um, you know, put the foot down, and this is not just in Canada, but in, in the United States, and it's with the biggest companies in the world, they're finding that a lot of people just keep leaving, you know, and then they're just looking for another job until they find another one and they're experiencing much lower productivity. So it's going to be a real problem, um, I think, as we go through the next decade. Now go ahead, Jonas. And, and I think it's not surprising from that sector because it's a sector where you have inherent security risk with transferring data. And I think one of the overlooked things of remote work is from a security perspective, it's still hard. If we look at the last couple security incidents that were worldwide, all of them were caused, <clears throat> the last bus one was caused by someone having an outdated system in their network. Like as an employer, how would you control that that employee keeps track of their little hobby project where they store their films? Um, the 3CX exposure was also 
but a remote working person that had uh, a trading software installed that that also was hijacked. So like we are now in this age where you also have to keep track of your employee laptops and own, own that network. Or you need to like issue laptops to everyone that are company owned. You can't do your private things on it. And I think that's also why we're seeing co some companies struggle with it because there is quite a lot of security you now suddenly need to do. You not only need to keep um, tabs on your network and your infrastructure, but also now there's all these devices that are dialing in, extracting data that look like exfiltrating data, but they aren't. And, I think that's going to be a difficult uh, thing to navigate in the future. Yeah. And, and some companies have gotten, I mean, the way to do this for a company generally is to issue a computer and then make sure that people are clear that it's not private. Like, you know, like we can go in if, you know, for most large companies, they're going to issue a computer and they're flat out when they hand it to you that says we can, we can commandeer this computer at any point in time and look at it and everything else. And you're signing away any kind of any level of privacy on that machine. You also, you know, there's a there's also a, a, a set of security protocols that you're expected to, to keep, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that there's, um, it can be done, but what happens is companies resist, they're trying to get people to come back. And so they're not investing in what happens if they don't come back, you know, and, and so the, and I think that that's where they're gonna have to invest. But I think that we're not, uh, again, what we're seeing over and over and over again, you have people who are trying to, sell us that people want to come back to the office or that people are coming back to the office. They want to sell us that physical events are going to grow back to where they were before. They want to sell us on all those things because they're trying to, they're trying to, if they have enough energy, try to move it that direction. The problem is, is that that's not what we're seeing. <laughs> like, 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 you know, the whole thing is sliding the other direction and, and you have a lot of people talking about it, but um, a lot of employees, when they look back at like the amount of driving they were doing, the amount of lost time, the amount of all the other things, they just don't want to do it anymore. Um, and I don't think that, I think that some employees are definitely need to go to the office to be effective, but a lot of uh, employees can do just as well, if not better, uh, and manage their life in a more effective way uh, without doing that. And so I think it's going to be, it's going to be a real challenge. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Christian Kohler in Somerset, New Jersey. And Christian asks, can you use the MV7, the Shure microphone, directly with a USB-C iPad Air, or do I need to use an interface? And if so, any recommendations? Go on, Alex. You know, this is an interesting one because my initial thought was that the MV7 was class compliant, meaning it doesn't require any special drivers. Now, I'm posting a link here because they actually have a compatibility guide with very specific information on using it with a lightning connector and using it with iPad devices that have a native USB-C connector. And according to this article, they're saying the MV7 is not compatible with iPads with USB-C ports. So I, I would have to say if, if they're saying it's, it doesn't work, the other option would be to use the XLR output on the MV7 and then use that with a class compliant audio interface over USB-C going into the iPad and that should work. Yeah, I was trying to, I am almost certain we've already done this in the past. <laughs> so, so I don't, whether it's listing it or not, uh, we had to send out an MV7 and have someone connected to an iPad, and we were successful at that, doing that. I think that the the issue is that, that you, we had to plug it in into a, um adapter that allowed us to give it, give the iPad power, not so much because it needed it, but because it would run out of power. You know, it was powering the mic. Um, but but I, uh, I am not 100% sure, but I'm 99% sure that we've already done this with an iPad because we had to send a mic out to somebody and we use the MV7s for that for uh, Michael Krasny's show. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, and uh, Alex, have you had success with the Apple Lightning adapter that has uh, both the Lightning and the the, the USB. pass through USB-C? Yeah, yeah, we, that's that's our primary way. I mean, so the, the, let's see if I have one here. It's not the least expensive way to do it, but the one that we used with iPads the most is um, this uh, USB um, uh, USB Pre Two. So this is a um, uh, this this is what we connected to generally. Um, so we have a um, USB to that pass through with power, and we were able to make that work. And so that that's that's what we've used in the past, and it's been really successful. Um, I'm sure that there's other class compliant ones that are. That are there, um, and so, but, but I know that we've sent them to the newer iPads, and I, I think the newer iPads, um, yeah, I, I, we've definitely sent 
mics out to the newer iPads and they've been MV7s and they have worked. So I'm not, they may not be listed as supporting and maybe they don't always, but for us, that's been successful. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, trading in a 2019 16-inch MacBook Pro for a new Mac and wanting a lighter laptop. Will the new larger Air be a viable alternative to the new MacBook Pro, or should I wait for WWDC for the M2 Air? I go ahead, Bill. Well, this is one of those things where it depends on your use case. Um, I have both my traditional 16-inch uh, MacBook Pro and I have a new M2 MacBook Air in my voiceover booth. I will tell you the technology in the, in the M2 is far advanced over this one. But what I lack in the inability of me to use a machine like that here is pure connectivity. There are only two USB-C Thunderbolt adaptable ports on the Air, and I have four on this laptop, plus one of them is on a dock that gives me a variety of other input and output, and I have most of those filled up. So if you do really complex work, I do video editing and obviously everyday webcasting here, and I have something attached of nearly every in and out I have available on my computer. I don't think there's any way I could do that on the air, even though it's a blazingly fast and really useful piece of hardware. You have to figure out what your use case is and then buy for that, in my opinion. And a quick reminder that you can ask questions throughout the hour. So it, um, we, you can ask uh, questions for the first hour, which is, of course, just general questions. We've got a great panel here. Jonas is here. We don't have Jonas on very often. So if you've got the technical, the cloud, the networking, the programming questions, uh, make sure to throw those in uh, for this first hour and make sure to vote on the questions so we know which ones you'd like to talk about first. And then if you have suggestions, we're brainstorming for infrastructure. So again, those technical details. Uh, if you've got ideas around, um, you know, everything from, you know, the, the logistics of, of putting together events to the cloud to uh, the technical ends of those things, those are the things, you know, the non-audio video graphics or business things that it takes to get a show done. Put those suggestions in for the second hour. All right, let's go to the next question. Next one comes to us from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. And Andy says, a travel mic for those with money to burn. And he links a teenage engineering product, the CM15. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of teenage engineering. I don't get the mic. <laughs> like I don't get the, this form factor in general has not been very successful for me. Um, and not this specific mic, but the, these, these uh, st this style of mic. Uh, they they seem to be very um, open to a lot of plosives and so on and so forth. So you have to be really careful with them. I also think that taking a mic on the road that is that expensive um, and that sensitive, there's just not a lot of places on the road where that actually works. So I don't I don't quite understand why they're getting into the mic business. Um, you know, as opposed to the other things that they do, which they they make some synthesizers that are pretty awesome. Um, and so uh, so I'm I'm kind of it was a kind of a curious choice. Um, yeah, go ahead, Alexander. Yeah, I was just going to echo what you were saying. I don't understand why they're doing this because as far as I know, they make synthesizers. So to get into the microphone business is weird. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. They don't have the brand cachet too for microphones, right? Because this, right. I don't know, anything can happen. But I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't understand it. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question comes from Douglas Carmichael. And Douglas asked, has anyone on the panel used an Apple Watch? I have an iPhone 14 Plus and an Apple TV 4K and love both, but I'm not normally a watch wearer. Is it worth it to put your watch on your mobile plan? Uh, go ahead, Alex. I think it is. I mean, at the moment, I don't have an Apple Watch. I've always been a watch wearer. I, ever since I was a kid, always had analog watches on. I've had various Apple Watches in my lifetime, and I've always enjoyed them. I primarily tend to use the device for health tracking and responding to messages, which is really nice. And I have to say, once I got the LTE plan, having the freedom to not have the cell phone with me in my pocket is really, really nice. Being able to uh, just take my AirPods if I want to go exercise or I want to go for a walk, uh, it's great. I don't have to, I don't like the constant distraction of taking the device out of my pocket. And sometimes I just don't want to carry it. So if that is something that you think that might be valuable to you, I'd say an Apple Watch is a really, really great solution. And Bill, real quick. 
hundred percent everything he just said changed my life in a lot of ways. And particularly during the pandemic, starting to get into the silliness of closing the rings for exercise has made a significant difference in my health. Also, the first time I pounded the floor plan with the dog and it set off the, have you fallen? We're going to call somebody if you don't respond in a couple of minutes. It has just made me feel hugely better about my wife and I wearing these just to know if we get into a circumstance where we get knocked over, then somebody will come. Next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. DPA has announced new pencil mics, the 2012 card and the 2015 wide card as more rugged versions. Are these on anyone else's radar yet? Uh, go ahead, Alex. You know, Craig, you're feeding my very unhealthy microphone obsession, and it wasn't on my radar, but now it is. They look fantastic. I must admit, I've never used a DPA microphone, but I know they're very well regarded in the industry and among many people on the panel here, so I might have to try them, and they sure look great. DPAs are great. I haven't used their pencil mics, um, but um, there's I've used a lot of their mics, and every mic that you get from DPA does exactly what it what you expect it to do, and it does it really well. <laughs> so, so if it's if it's following, if if the specs look like what you're looking for, it should be a solid mic. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Marty Peseta Jr. in Los Angeles, and Marty says some upfronts, Snap and Disney, are bundling 1080p SOT assets to disguise screensavers eliminating EVS. I've been using my Blackmagic HD shuttle as a cheap man's EVS, putting output into systems and camera returns. Can you recommend a good cheap 9-inch monitor? I kind of understand the... Uh, um, the the connection of that with an EVS is a, um, yeah, I, I I I have to, I don't quite understand the question. <laughs> like I think I think that's the that's the issue that I have there. But to get to the actual, could we recommend a good nine inch monitor? The um, good and if you're looking for inexpensive, uh, you're probably looking at Feel World or Lilliput. Those are the probably the two solid ones that are in the sub three hundred dollar category uh, that are going to be nine inches. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Jack Rupel in Brooker Ridge, Colorado. Uh, Rupel, I keep getting that wrong, and I'm sorry, Jack. Jack Rupel. Uh, anyone streaming in RO three D? Any RO three D content available for free or paid? And in the U.S. Uh, I. I think that this war is over. <laughs> like, like I mean, the, there's a there were a whole lot of formats, and then Apple picked Atmos, and now I think that we're just kind of like, okay, well, like I, I don't I don't think that I mean Sony has its own. There's Aura 3D. There's a couple other ones, but I don't. I think that you know, ev ev I don't hear anybody talking about anything else now. Like we definitely all looked at other formats while we were while it was even, but now I don't think anybody's looking at anything other than than Atmos. Um, next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Simple question. Are you saddened by the passing of BuzzFeed? Go ahead, Alex. You know, it always saddens me when people lose, when good people, good writers lose jobs. I must admit, I was never a fan of BuzzFeed. I never paid much attention to it. But I think the, the overall, the bigger discussion to, to be had is that a lot of companies uh, like this are having problems sustaining themselves because they traditionally relied on advertising. And we keep seeing in this industry and in podcasting, we see advertising numbers constantly shrinking all the time. And uh, a lot of companies have, some have been successful, like the New York Times, moving towards subscriptions. And that's just going to be an ongoing challenge. Next question. Douglas Carmichael. Up next, he says, in a discussion about UK emergency plans, they included soothing classical music recordings on BBC Radio to calm the, pop uh, the population. Given the nature of such a project, wouldn't it be easier to use an orchestral library like Spitfire and a DAW? It's an interesting way to think about it. <laughs> like, I, I find there's something very dystopian about something going horribly wrong and then playing classical music. I just feel like that's there's a, there's a movie that's going to use this idea somewhere and they're going to ruin it for everyone. Someone in the BBC is going to be like, well, we can't use it now. And it's going to be some like zombie apocalypse of like, you know, there's going to be a video. I can see the clip of, of zombies roaming around uh, with... Uh, you know, eating people with uh, classical music playing in the background. And and I, I just see this, uh, I see it in our future um, coming. Yeah, go ahead, Jonas. It, 
it is a really weird feeling. So in Germany, we have um, for the alerts in the schools, there's a robotic voice that tells you what's going on, that there's like a gun incident or something. And then suddenly you hear this classic piano music telling you to calm down. It is really weird, it's but so it has shown really effective um, sometimes. Uh, I yeah, I, it's I, weird. I, I it guess might you, be like a European thing that we just replace like annoying alerts with I, the classical music. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a weird feeling. I have a hard time believing that there's any science behind it, and given that the sample rate of actual emergencies is so low. I think someone just decided it was a good idea and did it, and and I think it's because I just don't think there's that many emergencies. So how would you know? How would you know? Anyway, it's it's very. Uh, um, Courtney said, as long as it's not, it isn't Bogner, which would be a little, that'd be super <laughs> weird. Um, yeah, go ahead, Bill. Uh, I had, when I was a young man, a series of albums called Environment, and it was just it's calming environmental sounds. It was gentle breezes and wind through the trees and things like that. I just, if taken to extreme, you know, I'll know I'm in trouble if all of a sudden a gentle rainstorm appears on all my media. <laughs> That's what we need is rain on a metal roof. I mean, I think yeah, that's the, you know, like, just, just, it's all just fine. It's just fine. Yeah, exactly. I, I think they just need someone whispering, it's all going to be okay. It's all going to, it's just going to be fine. Yeah. Um, next question. Next question comes to us from John Fultz in Sealing Grove, Pennsylvania. A Jonas question, perhaps. Can you trigger a bit focused companion event from an HTML page? Go, ahead, Jonas. Yeah. So that's, Two issues you're going to need to solve there. You need to have the HTTP um, website and be able to access Companion. So if, because um, what a lot of people don't realize is like you're on your local system, you built your little HTML app, then you share the HTML uh, through some means with the internet and suddenly it stops working because people have access to the HTML, but not to Companion. So you'll also need to expose Companion to the internet or use a relay service to relay commands to Companion. And then it is very simple. Companion actually has a nice little uh, simple API. Um, cut to this. It's You can just use slash pre press slash bang slash one slash two. And that is all here in the remote control commands. They actually have a pretty extensible API for this. Um, I've been doing some projects where we use uh, this exact syntax with just a normal HTTP call website where we didn't use Axios to uh, send those commands. But be aware that you still need to have a means of reaching companion and otherwise you need other services that, yeah, that allow you to ping it through the public internet without exposing it to the internet. Next question. David Brady in New York City says, what kind of micro four thirds lenses should I be on the lookout for in Akihabara? I've got a 70 millimeter F 1.7, a 12 to 32 millimeter and a 45 to 150 millimeter. You know, I think that if you're going to Akihabara, uh, I think that the main thing is, is that uh, just look for all the weird lenses that are there. There are so many. There's so many lenses um, in that area. So there's, uh, if you go to Yodabashi or Big Camera, those are the two big ones that are that are in that area. Um, there's gonna be a whole floor that's dedicated and you'll see a set of cameras and a set of lenses that you didn't even know existed. So I wouldn't look for anything specific other than be uh, be curious <laughs> and wander around a little bit, um, you know, and, and take a look at it. But you'll see a lot of lenses that um, are, are very, uh, um, unique that are that are there that you probably would never see in the U.S. So I wouldn't again look for something specific, but look for art lenses and so on and so forth that might be there. The other thing to look at if you're there uh, in Akihabara, this isn't for those listening. This is a, a section of um, uh, Tokyo. Um, and um, anyway, the other thing to look for is there are some small shops that are not part, not big camera Yodabashi. There are these little ones that are kind of hidden down by the streets. And you, the way you can, the way I find them is that you'll see unfinished cables on the outside. <laughs> they're, they're like, there'll be a rack that they're selling unfinished cables. You're like, that's how I ran into it. I was like, why is that the case? And and I walked in and you go under, you go kind of go under the cloth and suddenly you're in this whole space um, of uh, raw materials. And every 10 feet, it goes from LED to buttons to things. And it's people grabbing onto things and doing fast. Mostly uh, women are mostly in there grabbing um, lots of, small components to do really fast, like same day fabs where they're soldering stuff together. And so they're all down, they're all kind of moving through there. I, 
I think I have some pictures of it somewhere. It's a really fascinating thing, but that's where all the cool stuff is. <laughs> like, Cause you can also, you go up the stairs into that area and they have all these kind of vintage stuff and every little bit. And we always know where it is because, and I, if you ping me in discord, I'll send you a link. I, I think I have a, a little flag where it is. And the reason we do that is because when we're doing productions in Japan, it's the one place we can find raw materials if we had to build a cable. Um, and so it's, it's a really important, <laughs> it's much more important to us than big camera. Um, anyway, so, uh, check it out though. Um, but, but check out, look just for the artsy lenses. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, up next. Does the new Insta360 Flow, and he's got the link there, capture any of the magic of the Insta360 link as a webcam utilizing the built-in tripod and AI features? I think it's just two different two different things. I mean, there's some tripod uh, uh, capabilities for it, but I don't, I don't really see the two of them crossing over that much. Go ahead, Jonas. It certainly seems to catch the magic of getting a lot of questions asked about it on office hours. <laughs> but other from that, I don't see it being too similar. Yeah. Next question. John Bontrager says, I snagged a pair of tickets to the U2 concert at the Sphere in Las Vegas. Is anyone else here in office hours going? A pre-concert meetup, of course. Let's volunteer John's house. I am so curious, John, as to what your experience will be. So please, maybe even come on to office hours and we'll ask you questions about the experience that's there. Uh, we're a lot of us are very curious about the sphere. Uh, the sphere, by the way, for those listening are, is a, um, it's a giant black sphere that was built in Vegas by uh, Madison Square Gardens MSG or the company that owns Madison Square Gardens MSG. And um, I think that the, I believe they spent a billion dollars on it. <laughs> like it was, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so far, money. so far. Uh, they had a real problem getting so far. the 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 scuttlebutt of this is that they uh, they've had a real problem getting bands to actually come and play there because the bands feel like it's really about the space and not about them. And uh, but you you two really likes the spectacle, and they also like the enormous amount of money that they're going to be paid for every show. Um, and, and it is it is eye watering what they're getting paid to to be there. There's and this is really just a way to prime the pump because there's no way. There's no way that MSG is making any money because <laughs> I think they're getting 90% of the till plus I think it's like 10 million a show or something like that only on only 17,000 seats. And so there's just the problem really, the problem you get into, I know it sounds like 17,000 seats at $200 is a lot, but that's three and a half million dollars. And you know, it's, it's not a, or it's 10, I think, and I think YouTube is getting 10 million up, up front and then they're getting 90% of the till, which means they're only taking about, um, you know, 300 some thousand dollars a show. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it doesn't, I don't know if it ever turns out from this deal anyway. So, um, so it's, it's a really complicated problem that they're having, you know, with it, which none of us really, I mean, some of us said, well, I don't know if people are going to want to actually play there, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, most people thought that, well, it's a, it's a spectacle, it's Vegas, people want to go to the spectacle, but they're having a hard time booking concerts right now. Um, that said, you two may be the one that turns them over. You know, they're the type of band that you want in there. Um, they may be the ones that get people excited about it and get, I think other bands, every, every band wants to be the first to do it, but they don't want to be the first to do it. <laughs> so, so the, so I think that, um, you know, I, and, and I think it could be amazing and the sound is supposed to be amazing. The visuals should be amazing. So, um, I really want to go, um, as soon as I can, I'm not gonna probably go when you're going, but, but soon I want to definitely check it out. Go ahead, Jonas. Yeah. Being there in Vegas for the first time and seeing it while uh, taking the monorail from the hotel to the convention center, I just really hope next year at NAB they like turn it on fully. Because like just seeing the tests of the outside LED were amazing. Yeah, and it's like really that, that's a really cool part of it. It looks like just an amazing piece of machinery. So while they've had a lot of trouble getting it, you know, getting the response that they were looking for, the 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 what they've built is unique. You know, and it's always this, the, the hard part is, is that you always say, well, people should do things that are daring, and this is really daring, um, to move the world forward. But at the same time, some, you know, what they say is that in one step ahead, you're a leader, and two steps ahead, you're a martyr. And we're just not sure which one they are yet. <laughs> so, so, the, uh, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but hopefully they're a leader because it looks like an incredible space to, to, to be in. Uh, next question. James Fossiline in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota says, contacting tech support, you give specifics of a complex nature. Returned, you get a pat simplistic re reply that really doesn't apply. How do you proceed? Now go ahead, Alex. 
Well, the first thing you do is take a deep breath and try not to swear. I've been on the other side of this as somebody who's done tech support for many years. I will say that um, it's frustrating when you get responses like this because I still get occasionally I have to email people and I get these kind of responses. I will say kindness goes a, a long way. So the, the only thing you can do is just try to reiterate the problem um, because it's not that sometimes the person didn't read the question properly. You don't know where those people are in the world. A lot of companies outsource support. There could be some kind of language barrier there. So I just I would say just try to be nice and try to reiterate. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, I, I was notorious when I was at ILM of getting almost all my features added to software that we were working with with partners. And the reason for that was that I was super specific. <laughs> like I was very, very specific about, I understood how the software worked and I, and I talked to it in a very specific way. And it turned out that I would either get feedback about exactly why they couldn't do it, or I would know how, how to do it, or they'd write something for me to do it. But take a look at how, uh, you know, whether you're talking about it in a way that makes it clear to them what you're trying to do. Um, a lot of times if I'm calling support, Support for me means that I'm I'm kind of, I do some research, I figure out the language that I need to speak. You know, I don't say, well, this isn't working or the doohickey isn't, isn't connecting to the whatchamacallit. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm very tight about my description of what's going on um, and very technical about it. And I try to understand as much as I can before I call support. And that's not to try to save them time or money. It's for me to get what I'm looking for in the least amount of time and money for me, <laughs> you know, so yeah, go ahead, John. If it's a product or service before September 2021, you could throw it into chat GPT four. It does a pretty good job, actually. <laughs> go ahead, Bill. Also, just the tonality and Alexander kind of mentioned this, having been on the other side of it. But I find if I'm empathetic with the person I'm trying to get the tech support out of, it sometimes goes a huge direction, particularly in escalating me to the higher and higher levels. If you come in angry about the problem and you're kind of fighting with the first level person, they're not going to want to pass you up the chain because you're a problem. If, on the other hand, you can do the kind of, I know this is not your specific problem, but here's my frustration and it's driving me crazy that tonality and being the kind of person they want to escalate to the serious people in the back room who really know this stuff deeply has always been a good strategy for me go ahead Jonas make it easy for them to recreate an issue as a developer a bug is so fast fixed as soon as you can recreate it reliably if you know like okay I open the program I do X Y C there's Y and I think it should be X. If you make it as clear as that, the developers are gonna have an ease, much, much easier time to fix it. Um, with most of the vendors that we work, we work with, we end up being the tech support for our clients and we have better connections than into the developers being able to say, hey, look at that. Here's the like, we act as a translation layer to do this, like, hey, client, please do X, Y, C and document it. And then you can send in all the documentation. And it also brings you faster over level one, just because the level one is, oh, yeah, the, this looks technical. I have no idea what this is. Let's put it the next level up. Um, right. And yeah. Stay friendly. Yeah. I mean, being able to repeat something is the key. Like I, I rarely even report something like I, I, I get, I get trouble from developers who, who will say, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, well, cause I couldn't repeat it. <laughs> like if I can't repeat it, I'm not going to bother your time or my time of trying to explain it and everything else. I'm just trying to, you know, I, I sit there and go, okay, what happened here? And then I try to figure out you hit this key, then this key. Cause sometimes it's random. Like you hit not random, but it's, if I hit this key, hold it down and hit this key and then hit this key that are completely unrelated, it crashes, you know, like, and, and, and that can be just some unknown, you know, state that of course no one thought of when they, when they wrote it. I go on, Alex. I appreciate what Bill said about being empathetic. I think that's super important. And also what Jonas said too, uh, that's one of the, that was one of the frustrating things in my job doing support is when people, first of all, a provide 
next to no information about their environment and what they're doing. And being vague doesn't really help. It also creates a lot of back and forth as well. And, you know, when I'm trying to do my job and I'm trying to help you and you're providing very little information, the additional back and forth, sometimes for the other person too, will make them more frustrated, but they're getting frustrated because they haven't provided enough information. And actually one time, I'll never forget, I came into work one morning, there were 10 voicemails from the same customer and every message got progressively more and more angry to the point the last message was i'm going to keep calling back every five minutes until you pick up and that yeah. doesn't help you know it's funny though it's when one of the things as as i work when i work on software i look at every button and every slider as how many calls am i going to get about this <laughs> like like you know and when i think about what features we're going to add a lot of times i think about like you know what is what is going to be there that i have to manage and and so you know we, we try to keep it as lean and mean as we can but i definitely think like if something's a little quirky I don't, I, I try to fix it before we release it, um, you know, rather than being quirky. I think some people will develop stuff and they'll just put it out and it's quirky, but, and they'll be like, well, we'll work on it. I'm like, I don't want to deal with, I call deflection is a big deal. Uh, yeah. Next question. Christian Kohler in Somerset, New Jersey. Up next, I want to share computers come sound, no video, in Zoom while somebody else is sharing screen content. Zoom by default does not allow two devices sharing. Could I route the computer sound using audio hijack so that it comes through my microphone, he has in quotes, in Zoom? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you can definitely do that. I mean, you're going to get, you, you, it's easier to get clean audio going through the share sound, but if someone else is sharing and you want to put it in there, just remember that, you know, you, you want to turn off your echo cancellation. You want to make sure that it's on uh, music. Uh, those are, those are things that are important because otherwise it will either, it will oftentimes mute it um, in that, in that sense. So be careful of, you want to get it as clean as you possibly can going in. Um, yeah, but I don't think that you can have two different devices sharing. So that, that would be the only way for you to, to put that in there. Uh, yeah. And a quick reminder that there's still more time. You can ask more questions uh, for the first hour and make sure to add, put your suggestions in for the second hour. What, what would you like us to be talking about over the next, uh, the coming months? Uh, so throw that in for the second hour, first hour, you can keep on throwing questions in or vote on those questions uh, to make sure we answer them in the order that you'd like. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Insta360 Flow has built-in cold shoe to add an external microphone. Tested mics are DJI Mic, the Mammoth Lark M1, and the Rode Wireless Go 2. Which is best for performance and or low energy consumption? Heavy external microphones, he worries, might overheat the gimbal. If I was using a D, uh, I'd probably go with the DJ, DJI is probably of those, of those ones there, probably the one I'd choose. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia, here on the panel. Bosses joined the podcasting space with the new Gigcaster 5 and 8. Gigcaster, that's hard to say. Uh, looks all right, but lacks features that compete with the Roadcaster 2. Preamp specs are high, and he's got a link there to the Gigcaster. Go ahead, Alex. I thought it was interesting. It's I haven't had my hands on the product yet, but I haven't seen any product reviews on this other than Boss talking about the product there's a lot of people in this space. It it looks like a well built product. Uh, sound quality, I'm sure, is going to be the price? fine. It, uh, it's ooh, I didn't look at that in American dollars. I'm not sure what that is. It's well under a thousand. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper than the road. I think it was eight ninety nine Canadian, so it should be less than that in U S dollars. Um, but it it's an interesting product because they're also they also seem to have presets in there for musicians as well. So they've got reverb and other types of effects in there. So I think they're trying to cater to both markets i'm not sure if it's going to do either one equally well the having the pads at the, at the bottom i feel like i might accidentally hit the pads as opposed to trying to hit the mute button so i don't know it remains to be seen it doesn't have the two usb interfaces which i think is a really unique feature of the road i don't know how well it's going to do it's interesting yeah that there is a uh, and has you know it really is designed to send out it looks like it has individual mixes so it's got headphone outputs um, that are designed to give, you know, a, a, a series of different mixes back. Is that correct, Alex? Is that? Um, yeah, it looks it looks like that. And yeah. they also have only eighth inch jacks for the headphone outputs, which is a bit strange to me. Well, I think they're they're looking at a consumer, you know, that's you, that that potentially could use it there. I, I do find the the obsession with pads to be interesting, you know, but maybe just because I don't I don't really respect that process in most shows, and so I, I look at it going, I mean. I don't know what I would use that for. Um, go ahead, Jonas. 
in like every manufacturer of these products right now, where is the API? Where's the way to remote control it? Where's the Ethernet socket to have an HTTP protocol? Or even yeah. media at this point. Like we don't want like we re- I, I really tend to not understand why vendors don't get what we don't want their half-baked proprietary app. Just give us an API that lets us integrate it with other tools. Yeah, and they can definitely put the creature comforts in that yeah. they think are important. But but when they when they don't have some way to remotely or to take them over and 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 adjust them, there's a huge market that just kind of goes, well, okay, I can't use that. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead, Alex. The other thing I don't really hear a lot of people talking about, and I'm curious to get the panel's thoughts on this, but I still feel that there is a gap in the market between the ultra high end broadcast consoles and the really, really entry level stuff. Like all this stuff under a thousand dollars that these companies are trying to make, they're great for beginners. But for me, I feel like I want something. I want something in a rack that has all my I/O and just a single Ethernet cable going to a nice control surface and something that has Dugan auto mix and has more than four mic inputs, like five or six mic inputs. Nobody's done this. I look at what Telos is doing. I'm, you know, I'm lusting over some of the Telos Axia consoles, but they're just very expensive for someone like me. So I feel like a $2,000 podcast console or even $2,500, I would buy that, but nobody's doing it. Yeah, I've seen actually a podcast uh, console. It's about, it's under $2,500. Uh, it's rack mountable. Uh, it has a lot of, it has Dugan auto mixing. It's called a Behringer X32. <laughs> so it's like a, a rack, you know, and uh, you know, on good days, it's as little as $1,300. And I think that's the problem is, um, uh, you know, thirteen hundred dollars, and then you know, eighteen hundred or whatever for for that with a Dante card, uh, you know, starts to become really hard to ignore. Uh, it, it it went up in price. I don't know where it is right now, but um, I think with the Dante card, it's in the, the under still under twenty five hundred dollars uh, range, and it is an incredibly well featured podcast. Um, you know, space with only an Ethernet cable coming out of it. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas says, The MSG Sphere is fully based around a SMPTE 2110 network. Considering the data rates involved and the scale of the network infrastructure needed for the Sphere, what practices would they use to minimize lag and dropouts? Good, Bill. Well, I'm really fascinated by so many of the technical things having to do with the Sphere and the networking and lag, I would imagine, with that much data to drive that many streams must be an incredible challenge. I also wonder about the audio. How's the audio profile? You know, you've got so many reflective surfaces reflecting essentially on a point if it's a Sphere. Mm -hmm. How would they do sound inside? But there's just, it's a fascinating thing. Yeah, go, Jonas. That's one of the cool things with 702110. Uh, it requires a lot of engineering to deploy at this scale. You're not going to have any of the typical hardware vendors at this anymore. You're going to have big uh, Cisco switches. That's also where like latency is not that much or lag, how you call it, is not that much of a concern in this case. It's more of like, how do you keep the PTP clock there, a PTP clock monitoring across all the edges? So that's where you got to go into a PTP boundary clock and not only having one clock, but now you need specific switches. Um, I can guarantee you there's a lot of people that have worked on this for a long time to make this work. Um, but 2110 gives you all the tools to do it like that. Um, and especially with the PTP timestamping, you wouldn't need to worry about the lag too much. Yeah, and and the thing is, is that the funny thing is that it, it, to get a lot of signals, it takes a lot of engineering. But with SDI, it takes a lot of engineering too. <laughs> you know, it's it's you know, as soon as you start talking about big routers, you're talking about big money. It just costs. It, it it's not. It's just moving the price of that from a specialized SDI router to a generalized Ethernet router. <laughs> but it but it's or a set of routers. Um, to make that happen, and it's much more flexible. Um, but you're going to still spend the same amount of money. You know, like when we have a two a, a Harris 250, 256 by 256 or whatever was like a quarter million dollars, you know? So so those things just cost a lot of money. You're just going to have really big network switches that people aren't used to. They're not used to seeing, oh, I'm going to buy a switch for $40,000, you know? And, uh, you know, that's the that's the that's what's changing now. Um, but it, it actually, I think, will over time uh, lower the, the, the amount of cost because these are more generalized solutions, not specific ones to, to BNC. Next question. 
David Chamides, it looks like. Uh, oh, Chamides, Chamides, there we go, Los Angeles. Best way to share video clips over Zoom or other apps with no lag. I'm using this to teach students. Best app, setting, size, and codec of the video clip he's concerned with. I go ahead, Alex. I would get three things, three things, an ATEM Mini, a Melee fanless PC, and play LP. Yeah, the, the, the problem with the, the, the mate, oh, well, maybe not. Uh, well, the problem with the Melee, if you're, if, oh, if you're using it for the playback itself, then that, that should work out well. Um, yeah, so I think that with Play B would work great. Um, the, uh, the main thing that you want to look at is, you know, how you're putting them back in. And you do want to just do it as a video camera. So exactly what, what Alex talked about is you'll have your video camera and then you'll have your playback um, solution there to to make that actually happen. And it depends on what you're trying to teach, but but that should work. That combination should work quite well. Uh, next question. Brody Hafner in New York City. For someone starting to learn coding, is code generated by chat GPT a distraction to be avoided or could it help to accelerate the learning process? Code, Jonas. I just finished a project that like required me to write a simple web page and I asked chat GPT and it produced okay code. Um, I think for learning, it's a little harder just because the GPT will hallucinate and like give you libraries that don't exist, concepts that don't exist in languages. And I think that's where, for me as someone who has experience in that, it's like, oh yeah, okay, let me just, like it made up a library for putting confetti on screen that was called confetti on screen JS. That doesn't exist. But then five Googles later, you know, oh, it's actually confetti.js. The syntax is a little different and suddenly it works, but otherwise you would have searched for like, oh, how do I import it correctly? Um, never trust anything that chat GPT gives you, but like it is great as well to like decipher uh, these cryptic error messages. That's where I have used it. Like give it your code and say, hey, I got this error message. Um, for beginners, I would try to keep away from it. If you need a little help in your coding, Copilot is so much better. Um, I use GitHub Copilot on everything now because it's grounded in your data. And that's like what's going to be the real big uh, thing with all the Copilot or Copilot X from Microsoft is it's grounded in your data. It knows what you're doing. So like Copilot writes the way I would write it. It knows how I use functions. Um, that's the better way to do it. I think ChatGPT is great to like explore things. And if you want that chat interface, uh, Visual Studio Code now also has a chat based interface where you can like mark your code and be like, I have no idea what this does. Tell me what it does. Or like, hey, right. can you rewrite this to use JSON instead of XML? Um, you could use ChatGPT to give you small assignments, like give it a prompt. You are now a um, teacher that wants to teach JavaScript. Here are the five concepts I want to learn. Give me example project ideas that I should do. Like use it as your, and then have it like actually re review your code. It's going to be better at that because there it doesn't have to come up with as much. Um, it, it's great for like working with input and output. If it needs to like make something up, it's going to make it up and then it's not that much value. Next question. Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. Is there a consortium to get fiber to everyone or at least internet to everyone? Um, a lot of people talk about internet, but it just means that they're not very, they don't understand what needs to actually happen, which is fiber to the house. Um, and uh, so we don't see any consortiums, but that mostly, I mean, we have to always remember that the folks that represent us are digital children. Um, and so they, they're not, they don't really understand what they're doing. <laughs> like, you know, and, and I don't mean that in a political way. I just mean that they don't understand. They don't, they don't know, know most of the stuff. And so they're doing the best they can. Um, next question. Gordon Lake, Los Angeles. What advice do you give to young filmmakers who come from a family that starts off a sentence with, how much are they paying you? Uh, go ahead, Jonas. I, I had that conversation with my parents a long, long time ago. It's like, there isn't just money involved, especially with our field and like volunteering. There's also training. Um, it depends where you want to go. If you are taking it as a hobby, explain that it is a hobby and it's something that you want to advance in. If it's something that is your career, I always make the analogy of like a soccer player goes to training twice a week. They would never be asked how much are they paying you to train on their field. 
it is similar with our craft sometimes where in downtimes or if you're just starting out, you might take jobs that don't give you value in the monetary sense, but give you value in muscle strength and like training it and doing it. And then often there's also joy in doing this free projects. Um, I, when I volunteer with my church, it's pretty, there's also like a second aspect of like giving to a good cause. Um, that's how I would explain it. And then sometimes you have to just ignore what uh, your current environment tells you and walk there. And when you are on a place where you then can be like, hey, look, I did yeah. this. And because of that, I got that. They'll be like, oh, yeah, that's awesome. We always told you to do it like that. Yeah, free. free. I, I often say that free is the straw that drank a thousand milkshakes. <laughs> so, you know, like it and, and you can get into a lot of things when you're willing to do something. Uh, a little bit less or for nothing, um, you, you a, are able to position yourself much more effectively uh, than folks that are waiting to get their full their full rate for everything. Um, I, I've definitely uh, slid into a lot of things <laughs> because I was willing to do it for for little or nothing to get started. Good, Bill. Even in the best families, though, there's also a generational delta. I remember that what I understood coming up in my era was vastly different than what my brother, who was 10 years older than I was, understood. And then his understanding was vastly different than my parents. As things evolve, it's very hard to use the old structure to judge the new upcoming structure because things just change in life and technology and everything just over and over again. You, you just have to understand the, you know, that the, the certain things will, will work out. Well, like I, I spent over a year showing up for tech TV for free and it really took about a solid, I've talked about this before, so I'll keep it short, but it took a solid two or three days a week for me to show up for tech TV to have something to show every week. It's an enormous amount of work. Not many people do it. That's why people, that's why they were excited to have me because someone would show up every week with something new that was a piece of content that would fill up seven minutes of their show. And, and they happily built that. On top of that though, I built a mailing list that then, you know, doing that for free for a year, year and a half, I built a mailing list that generated millions of dollars of revenue. <laughs> like, you know, so, so it was, you know, it, it, it uh, you know, so you have to understand where it is in the context of things. But, um, you know, you, there's oftentimes, you know, ways that, and I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't know that I would do, do the generating the millions of dollars when I started. I just knew that it was a good idea to get out there in front of people and, and uh, build a connection with those, those folks. And then I found the, the options later uh, to make that happen. Um, all right. We are now changing subjects and talking about what we're going to talk about. So uh, what we're, you know, infrastructure in a lot of ways on, you know, so to kind of keep on repeating kind of what we're looking at here is that on Mondays, it's really business oriented things. And on Tuesdays, it's graphics oriented things. And Thursday and Wednesday, it is audio. Thursday is fr uh, video. Friday is infrastructure and logistics. Um, and that it's a pretty wide ranging subject matter, but it's everything from the cloud and programming and, and infrastructure to um, shipping and how you get things done, you know, in, in those areas. And a lot of times those become interrelated as you, as you start to work on those. And then on Saturday, of course, is education. So today we're talking about those logistics and infrastructure of how do we get things done? How do we move bits? How do we move things? How do we move all of those things? How do we tie those things together? So if you've got suggestions, go ahead and throw those into Makana. And uh, it's kind of open also for the uh, for the group here, um, you know, like we're going to be talking more and more about streaming, uh, about, um, you know, cloud and virtual production, you know, the infrastructure of how that actually happens and the logistics of how that happens. That's what's going to happen here on the on these Fridays. And we're really trying to plan this out all the way into through August so that we really have, you know, we have a long term plan, we can start looking at what kind of support materials can we build for those and what kind of uh, you know, what, it give people more warning about what's coming up. So those are all the things that we're working on there. Um, so if you've got suggestions, go ahead and throw them in. Let's go ahead and jump into those suggestions um, uh, with the first one. Thalak Lopez Waterman has our first question this morning, and he's wondering streaming protocols, RTMP, SRT, WebRTC, and so forth. Yeah, I, you know, I think that there's probably one that is a overview of all the many of the streaming protocols. Like here are the major protocols. And we're all going to talk about them. I know that I've done a talk in the past about HLS, but we could, I, I think that we could go into an overall, this is what they all look like, and then have a day that we talk about SRT and a day that we talk about WebRTC and a day that we talk about RTMP to make sure that we really know it. And it's probably something that we could cover every, you know, I think we should cover streaming of some kind probably every month. 
um, to, to kind of keep covering, um, you know, moving down. It's obviously very important to our, to our puzzle. Go ahead, Jonas. I would love a second hour about what it depends on. Cause like so often our answers are, it depends, but we don't actually say what it depends on. Like when we say, should you use WebRTC, SRT, HLS, or RTMP? What does that choice depend on? And how yeah. can we train our audience to build a decision tree on, hey, this thing just happened. Where do I go from here? Do I switch from RTMP to SRT? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it's, that's a great idea. And I think that overview could really break that down for folks of like, this is where these go. You know, for instance, if I'm looking for the the, the highest level of interactivity, I may want WebRTC. Um, SRT is going to be something I really want to move the, you know, move data or files around, uh, you know, and so RTMP we thought was going away and now it's coming back, <laughs> you know, and they're adding more features. So, uh, so those are all things that I think you're, you're hundred percent right. That, uh, that overview can really kind of try to describe which ones are good for what, uh, next suggestion. Next suggestion comes from Juan C. Robles in Mexico, uh, Mexico City. He says, how to think security and protect your infrastructure. That's great. Great. A second hour. I mean, I think that we talked about this in the first hour, that, that this is a going to be a ongoing problem uh, for folks of how to how to make this actually work. And I know that, you know, I've gone from things that are kind of more hobbyish to things that are you know, state actors are trying to disrupt. And in those environments, you definitely operate differently. And so understanding security, the basic cybersecurity, but also just uh, human security of, of how we manage data, how we manage access, et cetera. And I think it'd be great. Uh, next question or next uh, suggestion. And, yeah. Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida says, can we spend more time on leveraging virtual hosts and processing? And he notes as an example, AWS to support media infrastructure. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be great. I think those suggestions, um, suggestions would be, uh, um, uh, of, of, you know, it's just a matter of finding the right people to do those talks. But but I think that uh, I, the more we're going to be moving more and more into the cloud and doing more in the cloud and doing whether it's editing or streaming or management or Zooms or all those things, um, they, it gives us a lot more flexibility. Now, we this show runs on hardware that is in a specific place, place but we know that eventually we're going to do that. And, and also when we talk about, you know, the, you know, it's just in a discussion with someone about what can be done in the cloud, you know, and, and stuff that we kind of see pione pioneered by companies like Obvio and, um, you know, where I can have a whole bunch of people, I can then atomize them into a smaller number, I can pull them back in and have them, you know, all talking together again, I can move all of those things around. And, and that's all something that you do in the cloud, like it's not something you're gonna do in hardware. Um, and being able to launch all of those bits and pieces are going to be important. So I, I definitely think that that's a great, great subject to continue to look at. Next question. Jack Rupel's suggesting uh, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math with today's social media, today's coding, today's computers, addressing tomorrow's issues and tomorrow's challenges. I think in general, I mean, obviously we have a day dedicated to education. So, but I think that, so, you know, if, if it really digs into education, maybe on a Saturday um, as we, as we kind of work through that. But I do think that looking at how um, we communicate uh, through those, using these tools, uh, it's going to be very important. Next question. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman, Salisbury, Maryland. Could we revisit basic networking theory, the layers, the best practices, separating networks for different users, uses and so forth? Yeah, we had some of those on Saturdays, I think, in some of the long days. I think we should bring it back and definitely do it on a Friday and, and do a walkthrough of these are the basic outlines and th this is this is how this all looks. Um, and we'll we'll try to um, twist some arms here of, of folks that really know it well, so that they can they can talk through what those what that actually looks like. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Samuel Nordvik in Norway says an overview of different virtual private network solutions and tunnels for different use cases. I know that Jonas never uses any tunnels. Like he doesn't really oh. believe in uh, any anything. I would like never. That. Uh, yeah, that that would be absurd. It's. <laughs> yeah, so there's usually like that. We need a tunnel. Let's. Why don't we talk to Jonas about this? Like, like how do we how do we have this all work? I literally deployed two during the show because a client <laughs> came to me and was like, "Jonas hey. tunnel rat doddle." 
<laughs> yeah. So, so the, uh, yeah, so, um, we'll, uh, uh, definitely see if we can, we can get Jonas to talk a little bit about that and what the actual infrastructure is to, to make that actually happen. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Data and communications networks such as the internet or 5G mobile networks. Yeah, I think understanding what the different requirements are. I mean, at this point, we're going to have to start talking about 6G. I, I saw an article the other day about that 6G, you know, they're starting the conversations about 6G. They don't know what it will actually do, but they said, we're going to learn from from the 5G rollout, which is a nice way of saying, well, we really screwed that up. And and uh, and we're going to, we're just going to, let's let's move on to the next generation. Uh, so so I think that um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Next Next question. Stephen Kimbrough of Berkeley, California says, taking your media on the road, what would you pack into two checked Pelican 1610 cases and a carry-on? Figuring out something along the lines of a remote interview with two people attending a remote conference shot in a house with great internet. I think in general, thinking about, we, we're talking about studios and we've got studio kind of, these are different studio sizes that we have planned right now. But I do think that there's another conversation that could ha be happening there, which is these are different remote kits. And this is a remote kit that you can fit with your carry-on only. This is a remote kit that starts to ship ship things out. And I would say instead of a 1610, I would highly recommend 1650s. Now, 1650s are a great, uh, we've found that those are the best um, size format, but we'll talk about that in another, in another time. Next question. Uh, Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. Networking infrastructure, QoS, securing and monitoring. I, I do think, as we said before, I think we need to be covering that at least once a month. You know, just the different things. So there's an overview that, that was mentioned earlier. But then I think we have to start thinking about how to dig into that. Understanding VPNs, understanding network monitoring, understanding QoS. You know, like all of those things can be, each one of those is something that we could be talking about. Uh, at least once a month and to, to kind of work through and answer those questions. It's just a matter of finding the right experts for the second hour. Next question. Jack Ruppel back again from Breckenridge. Uh, leveraging fiber and 5G connectivity for content consumption and creation. Two very different worlds, <laughs> fiber and 5G. But I think that bringing different vendors in that can talk about whether they're bonded 5G, single 5G, fiber, those types of things, um, you know, that that would definitely be a good one. And as a note for our producers, uh, we're cutting through these really fast. Um, so uh, if you have suggestions, uh, we we will wrap the show up as fast as we as when we run out of questions. <laughs> so it's up to you if you want to get your two cents in on what you want to see on Fridays. Uh, let us know. It's there's been plenty of suggestions, uh, but we're just going through them really quickly. So I'm just letting you know that we will get what we need out of it already. But uh, if you want to throw things in, this is a good time to do it. Uh, next suggestion. From panelist Jonas Dottel in Stuttgart, Germany. How to develop pipelines for live streaming and broadcast? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have specific angles that you're looking at, Jonas? Yeah, I, I think we have a lot of people in our audience that do like the typical one to two day load in. But there's like a totally different way of thinking when you develop a pipeline for a long or like let's say a show that runs every week, let's say a show that like a daily show, how do you build a production pipeline that like stays intact for two years, five years, yeah. 10 years? And like what design considerations do you will need to build into like building a pipeline where you can't just be like, oh yeah, let me like pull this out, check if it works and pull it back in again. Yeah, I was just talking to someone about doing something that's 24 seven as well. So that, that changes the whole infrastructure. It's like, they're going to run it not for years, but for maybe a year and they're going to, they're going to turn it on, but they want it to run 24 seven. So there's some playback, there's some live, there's some stuff they want to insert into BODs. There's, there's extra graphics on top of it. So now you're looking at, you know, using something, whether it's Softron or just play or, or just, a, you know, a couple different, there's a couple different formats there that, that can be used. And I think that figuring out, you know, what those look like would be a useful second hour. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. I, I, this is just a terminology issue that I'm having. And I'm wondering if we need something to replace broadcast. Because still, whenever I see that, I think of transmitter towers and television. And I don't think that's how it's being used now. Webcast and, and livecast and things like that mm -hmm. don't seem to be grabbing hold. And I'm just wondering if our language is so far out of date now that we're not being well, we're clear broadcasting about i think that the problem is, is that live streaming has been used for so many things it feels small broadcast you know we are broadcasting you know we're right. casting out to a lot of people uh, i think that traditional broadcast 
I don't think it's going to evolve forward much, you know, and, and I, I think that you. a lot of that has to do with just the limitations of the infrastructure. So, you know, I think that a lot of when we're talking about it, we can be talking about resolutions, frame rates, all kinds of interactivity that you don't really see in traditional broadcast. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, but again, those become good second hours. Uh, next question or suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Studio design and architecture. What is the minimum and what is the ideal studio setup? One room or many rooms? Yeah, I think that, you know, we're, I'm going to be in the, have an opportunity to look at a space next week <laughs> to, to take a look at what, what happens with it. And, um, and so I think that uh, figuring out what to do with different spaces and um, would be, would be good. Yeah, Bill. And the corollary to that is what are the use cases that are most common now? I've built uh, everything from been involved in larger projects to my own conversion of a hay barn into my studio. And my needs would be very different today than they were in the past. And some of my clients, I'm thinking particularly of a large financial institution, built out a studio for what they thought were the about seven years ago goals right before the pandemic. And it's virtually useless now to them because it's just everything has changed so much in the the task they really need to accomplish that they would have started with an entirely different set of wants and needs if they mm -hmm. knew where the industry was going. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael, uh, SD-WAN technology like zero tier and tail scale. Yeah. Yeah, I think getting and maybe even getting them on to talk about what they do would be useful for this kind of uh, this kind of piece. Uh, next next suggestion. Another one from Jonas here from Stuttgart. Uh, scripting for live streaming: How to connect APIs and programs together fast? And again, what are you thinking specifically, Jonas? Just like uh, there's a really specific way that most of the people that work in a similar field that I do, like script together multiple APIs, like this this sort of like client comes to you on set and you have like two hours to make it work. Um, I think it might be great to give a little introduction to like, hey, this is how you fix an HTTPS error. This is how you like connect yeah. this output from the leak system to your H2R graphics or to your vMix. Right. Um, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, I, I, and I think that there's, you know, there's a, a variety of nodal versions, there's scripting versions, there's web versions. And so, you know, talking through those would be, I think, useful. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. And the topology of this, I still, after all these years and being on the show here, I understand that API is an application programming interface. I do not understand what that actually means. And only people who work in this industry understands exactly what's the difference between that and an applet or whatever. What's the overall structure of all this stuff? I think some of those basics could really help people start to get a grip on all the tools that we have to use these days. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Uh, Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, last mile delivery of internet services, straight fiber versus copper versus wireless. Yeah, I think that we'll keep on coming back to that. <laughs> Next suggestion. Douglas Carmichael says, universe, how to build control interfaces. Get yeah. it free today. Now that we can get it for free, <laughs> it makes it a lot easier for people to jump on. Uh, so I think that um, we'll definitely be playing with that more, 100%. Uh, Next suggestion. Rob Collins in Raymore, Missouri, best systems for one-man shows, like getting a Switch streamer to do uh, a Twitch, better broadcast. Twitch streamer. A Twitch streamer. I'm sorry about that. You're right. Yeah, I think that thinking about one person, of, you know, uh, pro productions, I, it would be would be useful. I have, I have to admit, I don't work on very many of those anymore, so I, it's hard for me to get my head around it, but I think bringing, bringing that conversation in uh, would be useful. Um, it's a... It's a it's a perilous business. <laughs> I, I, I generally just can't handle the stress of having only one person there. At one point of failure for everything seems seems risky. So so um, I, I don't have as much experience with it. But yeah, go ahead, Bill. I wonder if people would be interested in portable system in a box kind of things. What would you take out if you're going to do audio streaming? What would you take out if you're going to do a single camera video right. thing? What is the minimum structure that you can take out that still works dependably yeah. to do something like what we do? Yeah, and I think the hardest part is figuring out how to get the most out of it and where are the limits. You know, a lot of times we talk about the fact that it can be easy to make the content, it can be easy to watch the content, it's rarely both, you know. And so when you get one a one-person show, the question you always come back to is, are you building compelling content that people are actually watching? And that's always the, the challenge there. But you can, but it's like a lot of 
you know, pan tilt zoom cameras. It's a lot of pre-pro. It's a lot of planning to make, make all of those things work. Um, next uh, question or suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Carts, tables, and desks and other gears on wheels, oh my, with well-designed wiring harnesses so that you can thing. quickly <laughs> configure your setup on the fly. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We bring our own, like when I show up at a lot of places, I, people are like, they brought their own tables. I'm like, yeah, I brought our own tables because we know exactly what we can attach to them. Uh, we don't know what, what else is going to show up. So talking through that would make sense. Um, next suggestion. Jack Rupel, uh, Breckenridge, Colorado. Reverse 911 calls and Amber, Amber alerts how to generate possibilities. Mm, how generated okay. possibilities. Uh, okay. I'm not sure exactly how we would. Yeah, but, but uh, um, hmm. yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Um, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Labeling, diagramming, and documenting your setups. Uh, little labels. We can all talk. We can bring our, our, our labels out, talk about labeling things. Uh, it's, my, my labeler is never very far away. Uh, go ahead, Bill. I, well, I have been deep in OmniGraffle because I, I think I mentioned before I'm I'm playing with the area of audiobooks. And the processing back end is more complex than I thought it was going to be to make sure I meet all the quality controls of what they're looking for at the big services. Because of that, I actually had to pull out OmniGraffle and diagram every step in my workflow. And it turns out that I had about 25 steps to get from the the end recording to the actual upload of that. So documenting and diagramming not just your physical setup, but your workflow has turned yeah. out to be highly advantageous for me. I find that when I build the wiring diagram, I think about a lot of things I didn't think about that I would need. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I need that. Oh yeah, I need that one other thing. So it's useful. Uh, next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina, talking about fiber transport chains, getting audio, video, and networking from one side of a campus or a country to another. Yeah, I mean, I think generally understanding local fiber, you know, kind of regional fiber and then international fiber are very different things and how you get, how you transport those networks. I'm, I'm doing something next week where I'm connecting the West Coast with the East Coast over a private fiber connection. And so it's very, very low latency. Um, and, uh, but how, to, what does that actually take? And it, it's not something that I can just call and do tomorrow. It's something we had to plan for a month um, to get that to work. So, you know, figuring those things out and then, and then internally in one of those venues, we have fiber that's going from one place to the other. <laughs> so two different things. Yeah, we, we should definitely cover that. And next suggestion. Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. How about maintaining a list of recommended mobile bandwidth providers with pricing per gigabit of data, a big gigabyte of data? We would, but it's almost impossible to track. Like it's just impossible to know what it is because it's different every week. It's different every month. It's different. There's so many dependencies. It that, also what we found it really depends who you ask, like who yeah. you are when asking. How much yeah. data you're using like if you buy a terabyte it's different than when you say hey we would like five gigs a day or something right yeah yeah absolutely uh next suggestion paul wallace austin texas pop-up infrastructure that can be set up and taken down quickly you know i think that there's a lot there whether it's a pop-up set whether it's a pop-up you know kit whether it's a you know how do, what do those things look like and how do you get them up and down quickly i think would be definitely useful uh, next suggestion. Bo Cordell, Charleston, South Carolina. Take some of these topics and find individual case studies we can review so it's more specific info as opposed to generalized. Yeah, I think case studies is something that we I'd like to do more of within within our shows is to understand. And, and as we do more live stuff ourselves, we'll talk about our own case studies, but I'd also like to pull things apart and have us break things down more often. I think it's I think that's a really valid. Next uh, next question. Jack Rupel, again from Breckenridge, Colorado, fiber as utility, not monopoly. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to do that without politics. Even even when I mention it, I'm just like, oh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be good. Next question, next suggestion. Paul Wallace again, uh, turnkey setups that can be delivered and assembled with instructions on a high level and kits that get sent out on a basic level. 
Yeah, we send out a lot of kits and they, they range from a microphone to a 6K with a switcher and a Meraki and, you know, Mix Pre 3 with cameras and lights and everything else. And so talking through what it takes to do those different kits, I think would be uh, useful and, and what kind of instructions you have to send and, and do you send someone to support them or help them out? And I think that those, there's a lot of bits and pieces to those turnkey systems that would be great to cover. Next su suggestion. Jack Ruppel's back again from Breckenridge. Accessibility SAP Braille Reader. Uh, I need to know more information, but it sounds interesting. Um, next suggestion. Next suggestion comes from uh, John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. Library and asset management. How to know where to find physical and digital assets. Yeah, you know, whether it's, it's uh, you know, MAMs or DAMs that, that you're talking about, and whether they're online or in, in person, I think that we needed to bring more vendors in to really talk about those and then use those conversations as an opportunity to really learn a lot about the process. So there's a lot of big vendors that do this and we just have to figure out how we, um, you know, how we learn more about their product and also learn more about that technology. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, not only that, but the process of putting it together to do something. Again, I'm in the middle of that on the other thing that I'm working on, and I'm th saying it's not enough to have a block diagram. I have to incorporate into that a location of where to find it, which case or what place is it, or, you know, it's not just telling them how to hook things together. It's how to find the specific things necessary. The building blocks to build something is really important sometimes, too. Next suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, media infrastructure for co-working spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think that designing media infrastructure, one of the things that, uh, it's kind of funny. Um, oh no, it wasn't, it wasn't BuzzFeed. I was thinking about it, but I, I did a proposal many years ago with WeWork going, hey, we should put a studio, kind of, kind of like what Guy has with a one butt studio, but a little bit different. We should have a studio room that is just there for all these businesses to be able to jump in important meetings, do pitches, do launches, do all these other things. And they picked Cheddar to do shows. <laughs> that was, you know, and, and they just didn't get it. And I think that, but I think the co-working spaces absolutely need this because you can't make all those offices and all those locations streamable. What you need is our locations to do that and figuring out what that would look like might be a useful day of conversation. Uh, next suggestion. Next one comes from Mickey Makachor, our friend in Manila in the Philippines. Large-scale structured cabling and industrial cooling for cable plants, machine rooms, network rooms, and server rooms with an emphasis on cable management for fiber and fiber runners and the like. Yeah, we just need to find an infrastructure person to talk about that. But I think that would be a really fascinating uh, Friday. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. Yeah, I wouldn't just do it on the large scale. I would think the large scale are fascinating. When I see those machine room photos where somebody has taken, you know, quite painstaking care to bundle and label everything, I'm just gobsmacked. But I think also down to the local level and the individual level, what can you do in terms of cabling? I mean, a show looking at you know, what are five different ways to bundle a small group of low powered data cables together and which one should you use in which right. circumstance? And if you got power to run next to it, how do you make sure it's separated and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. Next suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, media infrastructure, transoceanic cables, mobile telephone towers, internet data centers. You know, it feels like it's almost too big, but I think that it would be an interesting second hour is just to talk about how does our data get around the world would be would be an interesting one because it's just something that knowing more about it, we just have to find the right vendor to talk about it. A lot of people don't want to talk about it, <laughs> exactly how it works uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, next suggestion. Uh, Alexander Knight, Vancouver, British Columbia, building a YouTube and or podcast studio and what to consider with respect to infrastructure for long-term reliability. Yeah. Do you have anything specific, Alex? Oh, Your studio. everything. Networking, like how to, should I put a, uh, a rack of networking gear in my walk-in closet? Is that a good idea? <laughs> Lighting, uh, ba battery backup solutions, um, how to account for all that sort of disaster stuff. I wouldn't consider it a walk-in closet. I would think of it as a server room, and then you can just find somewhere else to put your clothes, and then you're good to go. You just have to, once, once you take a walk-in closet and you put racks in it and you run cables from the rest of the house, it's no longer a walk-in closet. It's a server room, and you can write that in the United States. You can write that off as the square footage uh, of that is no longer a taxable location. <laughs> next, uh, next question. 
<laughs> Douglas Carmichael's up next, building a private LTE network, and he's got a big link there. Yeah, I, I think that'd be interesting to see. I've never heard of building a private LTE network, so it'd be interesting. Next suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, media infrastructure for hardened studios that are EMF protected and secure from solar flare, flares, intrusions, and so forth. There aren't that many of those. Um, yeah, so I, I think it'd be, a, it'd be ch a challenge. The problem is, is most of the ones that do that don't want to talk about how they do that because it'd be, make it easy for people to make whatever they did not useful. <laughs> so so it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to get a hold of. Next suggestion. Uh, Brody Hafner in New York City, a survey of good and freely available production document templates and samples in Google Docs and other formats, schedules, shot lists, equipment lists, call sheets, checklists, and so forth. I think documents in general, I don't know whether, I think this is another one that could be overviews and then almost could become their own week, you know, every quarter or something we talk about a different one. But I think that uh, an overview of how we build those docs, uh, I think would be useful for folks um, at least. Uh, next suggestion. John Snyder in, uh, in Reno, Nevada, says integrating ERP um, software with Ryan Rademan may be a Monday topic. Yeah, I think that Ryan, well, with what, what Ryan Rademan does, he, he works in, in the AE, AEC space of kind of managing these projects, these large construction projects. And I think that yeah, I have to talk to Ryan about it to figure out whether it fits into a Monday or if it's into a Friday, but it's, um, it'd, it'd be an interesting subject. Uh, next uh, suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, media infrastructure for education. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's where that would probably fall into Saturday if we start talking about education, but it's definitely worth talking about. Next suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, sports events and outdoor media infrastructure. You know, I just got asked to look at streaming some soccer games here in the United States. And um, and so I we may use those as labs uh, on our end. There's not much budget to do it, but it, I think it'd be an interesting experiment. And I think we can talk about what it took to get it out of the stadium. But also I'm thinking about how do we do stuff potentially with um, spherical and other things that we kind of we have a place to play. And so we're going to see what, what that looks like. Next suggestion. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, redundancy infrastructure to back up hardware, software, and cable in the event of failures. Yeah, I think that building redundancy into everything is, I think, an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, I think that we, um, I think oftentimes we overlook that, and but it's it's the it's your files, it's multiple cable. Like I, uh, we did this, um, we did this stuff in this one booth in NAB, and we had our master control and we ran separate fiber. So we ran TAC4 to every location. And then we had to run it like a month before. So they were setting up for, no, it wasn't NAB, it was CES. They were setting up for it. And so we ran from our, a, a completely different route to every location that we were gonna do a hit. And what was interesting there was that um, about a third of our routes, um, you know, one of the, ne never both of them, but a third of our routes got run over by uh, forklifts and ripped apart. And so we we wouldn't have had a show if we hadn't done that. So I think that figuring out what those look like, I think is important. Jonas? And especially having, like there's an alt to building, adding redundancy to an existing system and actually removing single point of failures right. instead of just stacking more single point of failures on the same line and not making it more redundant. Um, I think that would be a really important topic because I've seen too many people at redundancy and suddenly um yeah yeah you know the the interesting thing is is that it's it's not just it's also when does adding all that redundancy make the state system less stable so sometimes we make decisions like well that's a that's a single point of failure but you know if we add another version of that it might actually be less stable than it was before and, and like often people don't define uh failures like if you don't develop, define your failure states suddenly what does it even mean to fail? Right. Like there's this whole process that we need to go, that we go through when we define redundancy. It's just like every failure state. How do you, right. what is causing the failure state? How do you detect them? Who calls it? And how does the redundancy get activated? Because like automatic redundancies is also a thing that you need to be very wary of. And sometimes you don't know what the failure state is until you experience it. Like, oh, we should never do that again. <laughs> like, like, we never want that to happen again. But we didn't know that when we started the show. Uh, next suggestion. Uh, Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Cable building. 
Yeah, I think talking more about paid KO building would be useful. Next suggestion. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, BC. The possibilities of retrofitting an HVAC system into an apartment to mitigate melting a home base studio down in peak summer. Yes. Yeah, you go ahead, Bill. I spent a lot of time doing this since I worked most of my career in Phoenix and uh, all sorts of air handling, both in terms of the ability to keep things comfortable so that you can work. In my case, since I do a lot of voiceover work, silence of handling air and... Um, the costs involved in that in areas where you have a lot of heat to handle, they're all important things. And I th think that talking about them would be really useful for a lot of people. Absolutely. Uh, next, next suggestion. Paul Wallace, the server infrastructure on all platforms, Linux, Mac, PC, and so forth. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that, you know, covering those would definitely uh, make sense uh, and figuring out which ones are best for what. Uh, next, uh, next suggestion. Doug, uh, Douglas Carmichael, uh, direct out Prodigy audio routing and processing. And he's got a link there. You know, when you start talking about audio routing and processing, I start thinking about Wednesdays. <laughs> so we may uh, may move it. But that, that may be more of a Wednesday uh, solution for, for us to kind of figure out. All right. Well, we had plenty of suggestions. We just moved through them really quickly. So I just, we're get, we're going to end our show a little bit earlier than normal, but not because we had a lack of, lack of suggestions. I think we went through a solid 40 or 50 of them. Um, we have a plenty for us to think about for the next three or four months. And so we'll, we'll be publishing more about that as we move forward. Um, I want to thank the producers for all the great ideas. Um, you know, I think that we're going to be able to take those and, and run with them. Um, I want to thank the panelists. We can't do this without you. And, uh, it, you know, it's, Again, between the panelists, between the producers, and then this incredible team that we have on the back end that's producing these shows every single day, seven days a week, we're really seeing the beginning of, I think, a different kind of content, you know, this participatory content where, you know, the broadcast was very few to many, the, you know, social media is many to many. And this is this is everyone to everyone, <laughs> you know. So we're all building it together as a as a community, and so I I just really appreciate everybody's contribution to that in in their own way, uh, whether it's on the panel here, uh, whether it's in the, as producers asking questions and making suggestions, and the incredible crew putting these things together. So thanks to everybody uh, for putting that for doing that. And um, you know, when we have someone coming in from Europe. Uh, you know, um, you know, like it, it definitely pushes our Tlaloc traversal up. So Jonas, thank you for running our, our Tlaloc traversal uh, into the stratosphere, um, you know, so um, and, and, and being part of that. So 126,000 miles that we covered, 204,000 kilometers and one, just a little over 1 billion bananas served. Oh, for scale, I mean, <laughs> we didn't serve the bananas, but we do have them for scale. All right. Thanks, so everybody. And uh, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. It's always good when Jonas shows up. We know we can have all we, we can go to Absolutely. Back. Heavy. I couldn't, I couldn't react fast enough. Put in a bunch of, like, okay, we have Jonas's attention. Let's, like, ask. But that's Fridays. Fridays are good for that. I think we have to, like, when Yoda shows up on Fridays, it's got to be kind of like a Morpheus is fighting Neo kind of thing for everybody. You put it out in Discord. Here's all your tech, all your heavy questions. All right.